talking about this difficult subject, I, I don't know that there's really anything harder in the Christian life than forgiveness. Um, it really is something we struggle with and uh, we need help on, but we're commanded to do it. And so I want to look at it, continue looking at it this morning. If you don't have notes, uh, I believe we got some extras from last week. Should have some from last week, but if you don't, I could probably get Jax to bring you some. Jax, those notes are right in front of you on the thing there. So if you'll raise your hand, if you don't have any, he could bring you some. Got a couple in here, bud, so come on in and uh, pass those out. In the meantime, look at Ephesians 4 with me. Look down to verse 26. The Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have, uh, may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And, <clears throat> and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. All these verses here, um, they're all good thoughts singularly. They're all good things that we ought to, to be uh, uh, adhering to. But they all have to do with forgiveness. And so we're going to continue looking at that. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord to bless our Sunday school time. Lord, we are so thankful uh, for just another day that you've given us. Uh, Lord, another day of your blessings, another day of your mercies. And uh, Lord, we're grateful for that. We're thankful for the beautiful weather outside. And uh, we just look forward to the day spending it with you. And uh, we pray that you bless now as we look into your word and we continue on this um, command of forgiveness. Uh, help us, Lord, to understand what the Bible says about it and help us more than that to apply it, uh, to be willing to forgive the way you forgive. And uh, we'll thank you for what you do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so just a little bit of review uh, from last week. Remember, first of all, last week that we uh, spoke about how if we leave uh, unforgiveness in our lives unchecked, it doesn't stay as unforgiveness. In fact, it gets to be something called bitterness. And so when we're upset about something or upset with someone because of maybe how we've been treated or a wrong that's been done to us or whatever the case, when we don't deal with that and we don't forgive, um, it, it turns into, it, it, it's like the, I, I, I think I talked about a pot of boiling water last week. It's like that pot of boiling water that's left unchecked. And, and if we don't check it, we understand at some point that thing is going to boil over and, and cause us trouble. That's what uh, unforgiveness does. It, it essentially will turn into bitterness. And, and bitterness is, is an inner anger um, that, that uh, you know, I've heard it said many times. I think it's uh, even written down somewhere here in my notes. But I've heard it said many times that bitterness is the poison that you drink, hoping that it will hurt your enemy. That's kind of what it is, because we're upset about something. And so we're, we're over here, we're really uh, allowing that bitterness and that anger to, to, to mess us up inside. But we understand, really, it's not hurting that person at all. Um, and, and, and we shouldn't be, again, if we have a forgiving spirit, we shouldn't be wanting anything to hurt that person anyway. Uh, but anyway, we don't want bitterness in our lives. And so there's this thing called forgiveness. And forgiveness brings us uh, freedom from such things and freedom from the anger that comes along with the hurt. So there's a danger in unforgiveness. And uh, so we said the first verse we looked at was verse number 26, where it says, Be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So we really got through two things last week about, uh, about that, is that first of all, we need to recognize that uh, unforgiveness or bitterness or the lack of forgiveness, this idea of being angry, comes from Satan. So we need to understand that uh, the temptation to be angry about hurt is a temptation of the devil. We said that there is a sin in anger. Or, or here's what I said. Um, sometimes we don't know what to do. That happens quite often. So we just have to know in those moments what not to do. Okay, because there's a lot of times we know what to, we don't know what to do, but we just know what not to do. So what we're not going to do, or we're going to try not to do, 
is to not sin in anger. Now, again, you can be angry without sin. Um, Jesus demonstrated that for us several times. He was angry at the sin itself and at the wickedness itself. And uh, but it's very difficult for us to ba- make that balance in our life, or or be angry and sin not. It's a it's a it's a difficult thing to do because most of the time, if we're honest, and again went through all this last week, but most of the time, if we're honest, our anger um, is is very um, it's it's very prideful anger. It's a selfish anger. It's I've been hurt. I want vengeance. I'm angry. Uh, and, and so most of the time, we can't say, well, I have a holy anger like Jesus had. It could happen, and and it does happen at times, but it's not the normal reason people are angry. Most of the time they're angry because their personal rights have been affected, uh, their feelings have been hurt, uh, etc., etc. So uh, we decided we're going to live to not be angry in sin. The second thing is we would just say this, not to stay angry. Um, And that's what it says in verse 26. um, Be ye angry and sin not, then it says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So again, this is that idea of when we do get angry, because we will, you could probably look this week and, and look back at your week and think there was a time when I got angry, perhaps. I don't know, maybe not. Um, I don't know that I've gotten angry this week, but, but it could be that this week um, we, we, we've, something has happened and we've gotten angry. When we get angry, we have another choice to make. Right. We can let that anger set there and we can leave it unchecked or we can deal with it. And and the Bible is clear. Deal with it before the sun goes down. That means don't wait to deal with it. In fact, there's other scriptures that tell us that when we let our anger linger, we are giving place to the devil. Verse 27 says, neither give place to the devil. So that that really is um, it's like sectioning off a part of your heart and saying, I'm going to allow the devil to work in this section of my heart. We don't want to do that. I don't think anyone in here would say that's what my goal is this week. Um, but when we're angry and we don't deal with it, we're not forgiving. We're, we're, allowing, um, we're allowing the devil a place to work in our lives. We don't want that. So now today, this morning, I want to talk about then what to do. So we, we kind of last week looked at what not to do, which is to get in anger and stay in anger. Now, what we should do is... Point two, we should reflect biblical grace. Now, I'm going to throw a warning out right now that what I'm going to teach this morning is much easier to teach and to preach and to talk about than to actually do. And I just want you to know I totally understand that because you're like, well, that's easy for him to say, but it's not easy for him to do. I promise you some things in the Christian life are like that. But look at verse 28. Verse 28 is interesting because it, it seems as if the verse doesn't, fit the rest of the context of the passage because this idea of not being angry not not um verse 29 is going to talk about how we talk to people do you understand you talk to people differently when you're angry versus when you're not angry okay so that fits the context but then we have this verse in verse 28 that talks about stealing and it seems to be um well it seems to be sort of out of place it's not out of place Um, I'll try to explain as best I can here, but it it actually does have to do with what we're talking about. Verse 28 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. So we're going to try to model this biblical grace or reflect biblical grace, first of all, in our actions. Okay, what we do. Now, this verse, again, it, it's a, it, it seems to be out of place, but it's not. This verse is showing someone who has completely changed their actions. So what we have here is like a parallel word picture, okay? So imagine the person that used to steal. Well, God says, this is the commandment that God gives to them. Um, number one, stop stealing. That's a good commandment, right? Stop stealing. Um but the, but he doesn't just he doesn't just end it there. You see what the verse says? It says, "Let him that steals steal no more." And then he says, "But rather, this guy that was stealing, it says, let him go to work, labor." Why? Well, um, we see in other verses where it talks about so that uh, you have to give to your family, you have to provide. You know the, that that there's no need for stealing if you're working. Does that make sense? So you 
You know, I don't need to go steal because I'm working, I'm earning. But Jesus even takes it a step further than that. He says, work that you may give. You see that? So he's like, in other words, it's not just, hey, you, you were stealing, you need to stop. It's, hey, Christian, uh, you that stole, stop stealing, and let's take it a step further, start giving. Go work, earn, do what you got to do so that not, not only are you not going to steal, but you're going to completely make a change in your life to where you're now not a taker, you're a giver. So th there's a complete 180 in this person's life. Uh, let him that steals steal no more, but let him work that he may give. So uh, this is a word picture, uh, uh, same thing that we're talking about today. It's a word picture of, of what a change can be made in our lives with regard to forgiveness. So he's using the example of stealing, and we could preach about that if we want, but the context of this passage is, is forgiveness. So it's almost like we could say this, I used to get angry, And when I get angry, I gave certain things. I, I gave vengeance in my actions and in my words. I, I used to behave this way when I got angry. I need to stop doing that. And, and, and rather than just not getting angry, I need to give grace. Okay? I need to give grace. Uh, it's not just that we, someone offends us and we just don't get angry. We, ha we can take it a step further, as Christ said, And we'll look at another verse or two here in a minute. But we have the option to actually give grace. So I would say it's one. It's, it's normal for us to be hurt and to um, respond in anger. That, that would be kind of the normal human experience. Um, now, if you're, if you're not a Christian, or let's just say for those who are not Christians, that's absolutely the normal human experience. When we're hurt, Or even when we're not hurt, when someone disagrees with us or someone cuts us off in traffic or, or some little menial thing has happened to us, our response as human beings is to be angry. The, the teaching of the text is, as a Christian, not only do you not have to be angry, you can actually respond by giving grace. And that is a Jesus characteristic. Okay, um, it, it, the ultimate example, which it, the, the scriptures talk about here, that we're to forgive as Christ forgave. But the ultimate example is um, when when Jesus was heading to the cross. He wasn't just not getting angry; he was giving grace, wasn't he? He said, "I'll do something to help these people, even though there, there, there there's obvious wrong going toward him." And so again. We don't just have to not do something. There's something we can do. We can respond by um, giving grace. So uh, in our actions, in our actions, one of the, the ways that we can give grace is, is in our response to someone, in our, in our actions, how, how we would continue to treat people that have hurt us. Okay, we, as Christians, we have a, and I'll say, is a supernatural ability because You and I don't have this ability in and of ourselves. We have a supernatural ability to maintain a kind demeanor toward those who have wronged us. So in our actions, we can give grace. Uh, secondly, and this one, whoops, this one may be even harder, um, but the second one is in our words, the way that we speak. Now, this is tough here because you can basically say, okay, I'm just not going to deal with that person So that way, that, therefore, I won't do, I won't do anything that, that would seem um, vengeful. But don't we struggle with our words when people have hurt us? If you don't think we do, just get on Facebook for about three minutes. And you'll find out people struggle with their words when they're hurt. Because what, what are we going to do? We want to defend ourselves, right? We, wanna, we, we want everyone to know that our point of view was correct and theirs was not. And we're, we're, it's a self-defense that we're, we're doing. And that's why the Bible continues to teach us here, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Okay? So, <clears throat> again, this is that, this is that idea. Of if, you, if you used to steal, don't just stop stealing, but work so that you can give. All right? Look at what verse 29 says. Same kind of thing. It doesn't say just stop talking bad. Um, 
Mama used to say this, if you, if you got nothing nice to say, what? Don't say nothing at all. Now, that's pretty redneck the way I said that, but my mom was a little redneck. So, uh, yeah, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. Do you know that's not biblical? I hate to tell you, moms, that have been saying that, and I've probably said that to my kids. It is biblical to some extent, but notice he says, don't just stop talking. He says, speak to edify. You see what it says there? Don't just withhold words, but speak not negatively. Speak not vengefully, but speak to edify. Okay, look what, let's read the rest of the verse. Let no corrupt communication precede out of your mouth. That's mama's, what's she saying right there? You can't speak nice, don't speak anything at all. The Bible just goes a little bit further. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. James says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, this thing ought not to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet and wa uh, sweet water and bitter? Just like, uh, I mean, our, our mouth can be used for so much negative. You, you can tear someone completely down with your words. You know, they, you, there's another thing they used to say. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Is that true? That is false. Words can hurt. Words can tear down. If that wasn't true, then why does the Bible talk about the tongue being this small member, but being so powerful to tear down or to build up? So it's like this. So we're not just supposed to not talk. Okay, someone hurt me. Well, I'm just going to zip my lip. I'm not going to talk. No, use your words to edify. Now, edification of someone who has hurt us is extremely difficult. To edify means to cause to grow, to build up someone else. So uh, 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 bitter words, words of anger are not going to help anyone, but edifying words will. Um, I, the, the way that I've experienced this is that um, <clears throat> when someone... When someone lashes out angrily to you, says something awful or whatever, it's amazing how quickly this situation can go if you just say something kind to them. And it's hard to do. Um, sometimes it means, you know, uh, well, I, I don't really have an example, but sometimes it means just, just thinking through and thinking of something kind to say. I'm telling you, it's a lot harder for that person to continue their attack on you when you just respond in kindness. Um, one, one example is um, that, that I've, I've heard, actually heard this, ha had this happen in our, my life several times, and, and I've heard other people do this very same thing. It's like when there's an accusation made, and so there's some gossip happening, and that these people come to you, and they're angry, so their words are this or that. And I've heard people say, you know what, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe that's not all true. Maybe we don't know all the sides of the story. This person that lashed out at me, maybe he would, what do they say, hurt people hurt people? Maybe there's something going on in that person's life that, that is very difficult and they're having a, a very challenging time getting over and they lashed out at me, sure, they may have hurt my feelings, yes, uh, but perhaps there's something going on in their life. Let's just pray for that person. You know, just using different words to edify, to build up rather than to tear down. Of course, the Lord is, uh, again, our example for this. Luke 4, 22, And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? I've learned this. A mature Christian can take a big problem and make it small. A mature Christian can do that. A, a mature Christian can take something that you would think that's a big issue and they can minimize it. Where a younger Christian or someone not as close to the Lord, a carnal Christian, we might say, will take a small issue and make it huge and blow it up. How do, we, how do we either make an issue big or small? Well, how we respond in our actions and how we respond with our words. So rather than saying, you know, I'm going to give this person a piece of my mind, maybe exercise some humility, which we've talked about in this same study, and it does take humility because what do we, when we're hurt, what do we want to do? We want to 
we want to lash out. I can't be the only one in here like that. I'm pretty sure we're all got red blood running through our veins and we're all sinners. When we, when we are hurt, we want to defend ourselves. We want to lash out. We want other people to know that, hey, that person is wrong and we are right. And so th that idea is called vengeance. But what does the Bible say? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Let him get the vengeance. Let him sort it out. Honestly, let him sort it out. You just minister grace. Instead of getting angry, minister grace. So again, that's that whole idea. Verses 28, 29. Don't just not do something. Do something good, okay? Minister grace in your words, in your actions. It's amazing um, to think of what can happen if, if you just use edifying words, especially to those who have hurt us. Hold your place here in Ephesians. Go to Matthew 5. Just in case um, you think I'm making this up, look at Matthew 5, and I'll show you in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I said... And I hold to, this is so much harder to do than it is to say. It, it just is. So much harder than it is uh, to do than it is to say. Um, and and I, can I say this? I, I want to, we're just, we're all, we're all real people in here, right? So we deal with life. Okay, we have it's it's so much easier to talk bad about people today than it used to be. You know, used to you would you know, well the social media thing has just made it incredibly easy. People get behind a keyboard or a, a phone and can say whatever they want to say, and, and throw hurt out there, uh, post things on Facebook, whatever. You know, things can be said in in such ease today. And, and something that someone would never say to you, to your flesh, your face, they would, eat, they would say online because we get a little more powerful behind the, the keyboard. Um, and we also know there's probably people out there that will give us some likes and agree with us or whatever the case, you know. Um, and, and so I'm just saying it's, we're, there's, a, there's a real potential. The devil has more tools, I guess I should say, in his toolbox today to cause us hurt than he used to. And, and, and it happens so very often today um, that if we're not careful, we, we'll just we'll just live our lives in um, in that kind of fury of anger of, of what everyone is saying. I just just want to say that uh, because the world we live in makes it really hard to administer grace. OK, but Jesus is still Jesus. And he still gives grace, and we can as well. Look at, look at Matthew 5. Look at what Jesus says about it. Verse 43. You have heard that it's been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Now, if you have a good neighbor, that's pretty easy. But look at what it says in verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. So hold on. So, you know, let's say you got a neighbor. His name's Bob. I don't think we have any Bobs in here try to use names that I don't think we have any Bobs in here. Bob is a terrible dude, right? He's down there. He just drives you crazy as a neighbor. He's, he, he always cuts into your yard when he's mowing the grass. You know, he's just, he, he stole, he, he borrowed your tools and he won't bring them back. You know, he, he has a barbecue outside and he uses foul language. And you even heard him talk about you one time and say bad things about you. Well, you know what? As a Christian, I'm to love my enemy. So what do I do? I don't mess with Bob. I just I, I love him, but I ain't talking to him. I ain't dealing. With him. I just I love him. Jesus told me to love him. Okay, just because I'm going to get to the next part of the verse. What? How is love defined in the Bible? Is it an ooey gooey feeling? It's not. It's action. That's good. It's action. I choose to love. So if I say I love Bob, there's probably better be some evidence of that in my life. And let me, let me say it like this. Well, let's read the rest of the verse because it says, love your enemies. There's not a period. There's a comma. Bless them that curse you. When you got some extra barbecue, you bring it over there and give to Bob. Bless them that curse you. I love neighbors that do that. 
I had some neighbors that would cook and they just bring over the extra barbecue. Good people. Bless them and curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Three things Jesus tells us to do if we are going to love our enemies. Bless them. Do good to them. Pray for them. I can't say I love my enemies if I'm not doing those things. If I'm not praying for someone, I don't, I'm not loving them. If I'm not um, doing good to them when I have opportunity, I'm not loving them. If I'm not blessing them by words or actions, it, it's not that I got to go over there and do that all the time. But when I have these interactions with people, those ought to be the things I'm doing if I really love them. So again, much, much, much harder to do than it is to, to say. But look at verse 45. Why would we do that? That, may, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. How many of us have offended God? Well, my hand's up, okay? Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But how many of us continuously experience God's blessings? Well, my hand is up. You know what he's saying there? He's like, listen, love your enemies because I do. Do you know what you say? Do you know what that means? He he gives rain to the unjust. There's some unjust, you know, he's talking about, you know, farming really there. There's some farmers in this world that don't, care a thing about God. You know what? He still causes it to rain on their land. He still blesses their crops. He still blesses their homes. I mean, this is, this is the God we serve. He's saying, if I do that very same thing, and it doesn't just apply to farmers, it applies to everyone. He says, my blessings, my rain, it falls on everyone. Now, are there times where God is punishing? Yes. Are there times where God is, is causing a drought to teach us something or to draw us to him? I, absolutely. Absolutely. But, but as a rule, God's not just wiping out everyone who doesn't like him, is he? Sometimes we want that to happen, don't we? We just think, man, that'd be a better world if he'd do that. But he loves those people. Regardless of how they're acting, he sends the rain. So he says, I've done it. You do it. So how we respond. We, we have the choice. Okay, I, know, I don't know what to do, so I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to get angry, and I'm not, if I do get angry, I'm not going to let the anger linger. We can't stop there. It says, if you you used to steal, steal no more, but go ahead, go to work so that you can give. So what do we give? We give grace in our actions, in our words. Um, Jesus said it a little differently. He said, do good to them, bless them, pray for them. It's amazing what God can do with a relationship that's, that's needing mending, When you do good, you bless, and you pray for that one who's hurt you. Um, You say, well, they they haven't said they're sorry. I don't know that they've repented. I hear that a lot. Listen to this. You don't have the power to forgive sins, do you? Therefore, repentance is not required. Okay, God has the power to forgive sins. I do not. I'm just simply commanded to forgive. One of my friends on, on uh, Facebook, as I'm, as I'm disparaging Facebook, I'm going to read you something off of there today. He said this. This is Brother Bill Prater. He said, Forgiveness is releasing someone from any obligation they incurred when they hurt you. That means you do not need an apology, explanation, payback, etc., in order to move on, because you are releasing the offender from all that. I want to read it again. Forgiveness is releasing someone from any obligation they incurred when they hurt you. That means you do not need an apology, an explanation, payback, etc. in order to move on because you are releasing the offender from all of that. Um, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We don't have rights to the vengeance. We're just commanded to forgive. 
That means we don't have to wait for them to come groveling back. You know what that is? That's us getting our satisfaction. Isn't that? That's us getting our prideful satisfaction. Oh, this person finally broke down and here I am standing over them all righteous. That is not what we're commanded to do. It's, it's hard. You're like, how, how do you do that? Well, it's going to take God's grace because it's not in me. It's got to be of him that he would allow us to forgive. But I'm telling you, when you can truly forgive someone that's never said they're sorry and has not changed their behavior, I'm telling you what it does, it absolutely frees you from that person. It frees you from them. You don't go to bed worrying about them anymore. You don't go to bed uh, you know, mad or angry or stirring. They may still go through those things, but you don't because you've released them. Um, by the way, we got to get used to doing that because people in this world will hurt us and they will never say they're sorry. It's going to happen. They will hurt us. They, they will never say they're sorry. Sometimes they do. That's, a ble- that's an even better position when someone does repent because they are sorry for their sin and they got right with God. That's another thing. They got to get right with God to get right with us. You understand that? If I hurt my wife, and, and I'm, I'm mean and ugly to her, you know, I've sinned against God and I've pulled her into it. So for me to come to her and say, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm working that out with her. I'm also working that out with my father. I, I was listening to my dad. So one of the blessings of being an hour early here is I can listen to my dad teach Sunday school. I usually listen to him teach Sunday school from about nine until nine forty or something uh, in on Sunday mornings. And, and this morning he was talking about that. He said, you can't have a a right relationship with each other if you don't have a right relationship with God. It's, you can't, don't say you love me who you haven't seen. Didn't Jesus say that? Don't say you love me that you haven't seen if you don't love those that you're looking at. Isn't that funny that we do that? We love, oh, I love Jesus. You've never seen him. You say, well, I know he's, I I know you know him. Okay, I'm not, I'm just, but these people that we see and we deal with, God says that's a measure of your love. So, um, boy, I got to keep going here. I got hung up there. So we want to react with grace. We want to give grace, not just withhold anger, but now give grace. Third, refuse to grieve the Holy Spirit. Um, again, we could keep we keep reading the verses here. Look at verse 30 and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. So um, this this withholding forgiveness It grieves the Holy Spirit. Look how it does it. Verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So I'm not going to go over all this again, but bitterness grieves God. The fact that we're not dealing with our sin, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger be put away from you. Um. Many days we live this life without even thinking about that we carry with us the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, when we get saved, He comes in to seal us. He's our guide. He's our teacher. He's our convictor. He's our help. He's our encouragement. He's with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. But I'm telling you, sometimes we do not, we're not conscious of the fact that He's there and we grieve Him with our bitterness. Then the verse continues about that thing called clamor and evil speaking. That does, that grieves the Holy Spirit. And so we, we just need to understand, listen, He's with us. And that ought to affect how we uh, respond. So refuse to grieve the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Lastly, oh, and let me just touch on this real quick. Sinful speech. Um, you're only going to be able to keep it inside for so long. Um, because that bitterness, it's, it, there's a process. And if we had time, we could look at a few verses. But that, that bitterness is a process. And it's just a festering sore in our life. It's just, it's not getting better. It's not, most things don't get better because you ignore them. We have to deal with them. And so what happens is it, it festers, it boils, it gets bigger, it comes out. 
Um, I'm mad at so-and-so because they did this, that, or the other. But all of a sudden, I'm short with my wife and my kids. And it's starting to affect the relationships at home or at church. That's what bitterness does. You know, bitterness, we, we're, we're, in our mind, we're aiming it at that person. I keep looking over there. I hope no one walks right out there when I'm pointing. We, we, I'm going to point this way. No one's going to go that way. We keep aiming our bitterness. In our mind, we're aiming it at that person. But, you know, it affects our entire life. It affects our family life. It affects our marriage. It affects the way we, uh, I mean, I, I, I've done this where I've just, I've just snapped at my kids or been upset with my kids when they, all they were doing was being kids. And I'm like, why, why did that make me so angry? I'm not angry at those kids. I'm angry at something else. And until I deal with it, I'm just going to be an angry person. It's going to affect. It's going to spill out. So you can say, oh, no, no, I'm dealing with this. I'm handling it. But that sinful speech, that bitterness, it's going to come out in your life somewhere, even if it never comes out to the person that you're upset with. So then lastly, we need to reflect the Savior's forgiveness. And of course, we've touched on this both last week um, <clears throat> and this week. Again, God's not just telling us what not to do. He's saying this is what you should do, forgive. And by the way, um, forgiveness is not a suggestion in the Scriptures. It's a command. Look at verse 32. And be ye kind, that's also a command, one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So let's just recognize two things. We have a kind Savior. He's very kind to us. He's kind every day. Every day we experience His kindness. Th that word kind means to have tenderness or being of a good nature or being benevolent. The word tender-hearted there means having strong compassion or being uh, sympathetic. I, I've seen it said, and I, I agree with this, be kind to everyone because everyone is fighting a battle. Isn't that true? You don't know what that person uh, that, that you're angry at, you don't know what that person is going through that day. So just be kind. Be kind. Um then forgive. Forgive because Christ hath forgiven you. I, I, I promise you this. Um, when Jesus was hanging on that cross and his life's blood was draining out of his wounds and he was in agony and, um, he, you know, just there, there's, a, there's a bush right beside our house that has thorns on it like this long. And I don't know what kind of bush it is, but I think Miss Molly told me what kind of bush it was. I already forgot. But it's got big old thorns on it. Every time we walk by that, my kids go, man, I can't believe Jesus. They've said this to me several times. I can't believe Jesus would have worn a crown of thorns. I mean, because they look at that bush and they think, I, goodness, what he did for us. And while he was in that agony, he said, Father, forgive them. I'm telling you, I don't, whatever you do to me, whatever the world does to me, it'll never hold a candle to the way I've offended God and the way he's forgiven me. I, I will never even get close to the example Christ set where, where he has forgiven me, even me. And that, that crown of thorns was on his head because of me. And yet he forgave me. How dare we withhold forgiveness from other people. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, whenever I see myself before God and realize something of what my blessed Lord has done for me at Calvary, I am ready to forgive anybody, anything. I cannot withhold it. I do not even want to withhold it. The Bible tells us this, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This whole passage is screaming, don't just not do something. Respond with grace. Forgive. And so let's work on it because it's something we got to work on. And it's much easier for me to teach the lesson and read the verses and give some points than it is to walk out of this place and be a forgiving Christian. I recognize that. 
we've got to work on it because Christ forgave us. Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that I'm, I'm standing here forgiven, not deserving, not even in any way, shape, or form deserving your forgiveness. But you have forgiven me. I'm so very grateful. Help me in my struggle to forgive others. Help us all, Lord, by your spirit to live this sort of life that, that just doesn't hold a grudge, um, that allows you to have the vengeance, and that displays the kind of kindness and forgiveness that you've given to us. Help us in that. We pray that you would dismiss us in, from the Sunday school hour with your love, and we pray for the church services to follow today. I pray for our morning service, that you would bless it, that you would help us greatly by your word. And I pray even for our afternoon service, that you would, again, speak to our hearts. Lord, may we say today it's been good to be in your house, because not just because we, we did something, not just because we checked something off the list or, or, or did our Christian do today, but because you have met with us and you've spoken to us. Lord, we'll be grateful. In Jesus' name. Amen.